Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to have uh, Mengzhu here for here from Georgia Tech. Mengzhu is a PhD student there with Professor Fumin Zhang. Uh, she got her um, undergrad at Shanghai Jiatong in 2016, and she's been working at Georgia Tech since then on robotics and controls. And uh, we're looking forward to having her here at Purdue in the fall as a Linian Gilbreth Fellow. Uh, so she's going to talk to us today about a formalism for uncertainty aware decision making. So Mengzhu, the floor is all yours. Uh, thanks, Dr. Senra, for introducing me. And yeah, so I want to today talk about belief abstraction and symbolic planning. Um, so planning is one of the major functionality to achieve robotic autonomy. If we consider uh, common striving, it has a very large progress in recent years. And part of the reason is we have a large number of different sensors equipped on the vehicle to get a good estimate of both the vehicle state and the environmental state. But on the other hand, if we consider marine autonomy, here this video is showing deploying a surface vehicle in the eye of a hurricane. Then comparing to autonomous driving, we have very limited sensors that can give us estimate of both the system state and the environmental state in the marine autonomy missions because the spatial and temporal scale of ocean phenomenon is very large. So it is very important to be aware of the uncertainty in state estimation when we are making decisions in marine autonomy related applications. And I have been working on deploying underwater gliders near the uh, North Carolina. And here are two examples of our previous deployments. On the left-hand side, um, this is a success formation. The trajectory of the vehicle, which is the colored squares, covered most part of the region of interest, which is shown by the red triangles. But on the right-hand side, this is a field mission. After the vehicle uh, finishes sampling the northern triangle, it, is, it was supposed to follow this green arrow and go to the southern tri triangle to continue the mission. But because of the uncertainty, it was pushed into the strong flow region. The flow speed is represented by the blue arrows. And eventually the vehicle is lost in the ocean. So this is, I want to use this example to show that it is very important for us to consider the uncertainty in the, um, when they are making decisions. So what are the in marine autonomy missions? First, the uncertainty comes from the ocean uh, environmental dynamics. This video is showing a, a flow field model predicted by the NCOM for the Navy Research Lab. And as you can see, it is very complicated. And we have also observed in previous experiments in the ocean that the ocean model does not match with the actual uh, data collected by the underwater gliders in the ocean. So this is showing that the flow forecast can contain a high uncertainty and this will introduce a noise term in the vehicle dynamics. Another source of uncertainty comes from data uh, state observation. When the vehicle is at the surface of the ocean, it has access to the GPS localization signal, and it can get a good estimate of its current state, which is the position. But when the vehicle is underwater, the, it does not have the GPS signal, and it has to rely on the underwater acoustic localization techniques for state estimation. But the problem is most of the receivers can only give you a zero or one, the binary detection. And in most regions of deployments, we have very limited number of receivers or number of sensors in the domain. For example, this is one of our deployment region, and this is about 100 um, square kilometers. There are only 16 receivers in the domain, and it is far from enough to give us a good estimate of the vehicle position. So when the vehicle is underwater, its position can only be partially observed. Therefore, we formulate the underwater vehicle navigation problem as a continuous state PUMDP 
for partially observable Markov decision process. They model the system or the vehicle dynamics as a particle model. The displacement of the vehicle is represented by the flow speed F and the vehicle forward speed times the heading angle plus an additional noise term representing the flow prediction here. And we also consider the vertical direction um, movement of the vehicle. And we, we assume that the vehicle can go to the surface of the ocean to get a better estimate of the, its current position by using the GPS signal. And we use a binary detection model to describe the acoustic detection. So the tradition or the general way to address the continuous state pump DP is by defining the belief state. The belief state is the posterior distribution of the system state conditioning on the, all the historical observation we have. And given the belief state, we can design the control input that is a function of B, the belief. Then we have uh, we convert the pump BP into a fully observable system where the system dynamics is the belief dynamics. Here I'm using the operator L and T to represent the Bayesian auditing law and the prior dynamics. So this composition describes the dynamics of the posterior distribution. Given the belief, we can design the optimal control for the planner to compute the control input of the system. So we can solve the pump BP by solving two set problems. The first one is to give a model of the belief dynamics. And then the second problem is to solve the planning problem. So most of the existing solutions to the pump BP problems, they use this kind of methods. For example, the using Gaussian parameterization and use MPC for the planner. There are also um, methods based on Monte Carlo simulation. And uh, they use uh, tree search techniques for designing the optimal control of the system. And also in recent years, there are reinforcement learning based methods. They are different from, the pre from these two kinds of methods. They uh, find a model for the Q function and then they find a optimal control given the Q function model. So if you consider the first problem on belief abstraction or modeling the belief dynamics, then the one general, like one really popular method is to use Gaussian parameterization. But then with Gaussian parameterization, there will be problem if the system dynamics is nonlinear. And also if we have non-Gaussian noise, this would also cause trouble. Another kind of a solution, they use a rectangular grid cell to discretize the state space. And then we can have a finite dimensional Markov transition model. So, but then the problem with this kind of methods is the curse of dimensionality. If we have a higher dimensional system, the parameters needed to describe the transition model will grow exponentially. And this will cause a high computational cost in both estimating the transition and in solving the planning problem. Even if we can find an approximation model for the belief dynamics, solving the planning problem might not be easy. Here, this video is showing a robotic application where the robot arm is trying to pour milk into a cup. And this is a comp it's a, it's not a simple uh, planning problem because the robot arm is high as it has a high degree of freedom. And also this problem has a long planning horizon. The robot has to achieve several subtasks like to move one object from one place to another and to pick up and put down an object in order to achieve the goal. So the planning horizon is really long. And if we consider the marine autonomy application, we have similar difficulties. For example, if multiple vehicles are used for a cooperative mission, then the system dimension can be high. If we consider the time scale 
of end order vehicle deployments. It is usually 20 or 30 days. So we also have a very long planning horizon. These will introduce a high computational cost in solving the planning problem. So instead of solving the optimal control problem, we think maybe we can utilize or um, apply some of the existing solutions on suboptimal planning. That is, instead of solving the, looking for the optimal solution, we find a suboptimal solution. There are a lot of existing solutions like anytime or any solution algorithm. And also there are bounded cost search algorithms. We are especially interested in bounded cost search because it is computationally efficient and it can provide a performance guarantee. But there are also challenges in using the bounded cost search algorithm for belief space planning. And I will talk about how we address the challenges later in my talk. Um, any questions? Okay, so this is the contribu um, contribution of my PhD research. Um, I addressed the continuous state pump DP by two steps. The first one is model the belief dynamics or belief abstraction. We achieved this goal by two steps. The first one is to derive an irregular partition or discretization of the state space. And then the second step is to identify the transition model over the partitioned state space. We use a neural network based method. And then part two is on solving the belief space planning problem. So for the first step to partition, the intuition is in many of the robotic applications, the vehicle or the system state has zero probability to be in most of the state space. So we only need to allocate the uh, five conditions only over regions that the system state most likely will visit. We hope by doing so, we can avoid the curse of dimensionality. On the right, I'm showing a set of simulated particle trajectory show, um, describing the underwater vehicle trajectory in a dryer flow field with flow prediction error. And we find partition by simulating the particle trajectory. And then we solve for the optimal partition by minimization problem. That is minimizing the difference between the particle trajectory and the partition itself. This optimization problem can be solved by the k-means clustering method. And we see on the right that a larger number of partitions are assigned to the center of the domain where more trajectories visit. In partition, we have a discretization of the state space. Then the second step is to find the transition dynamics. This is a general roadmap on how we approach this problem. We start from the left-hand side, which is the unparameterized prior dynamics. I'm representing the unparameterized prior dynamics by the simulated particles, which are the green dots. Starting from here, we find the transition dynamics in on the partition state space. And we assume that the belief value in each of the cell is a constant number between zero and one. The gray color in each of the cell represent the uniform belief value. And given, the, uh, and we call the transition dynamics on the partitions, the primary space dynamics. And the last, last step is we further discretize the belief value in each of the cell to be a symbol given the, a set of pre-assigned um, threshold. So here I'm uh, only using three symbols to represent the belief belief value in each of the cell, the high, medium, and low. And by doing so, we have the dynamics in the symbolic space. The second step is easy. Um, the major difficulty is in how we convert the unparameterized prior dynamics to the parameter space dynamics. And so one easy solution we can think of is we can project- uh, Mengji, there's one question in the chat. Uh, Jayanth, okay. would you like to ask your question? 
Yeah, uh, so this partition is a Voronoi partition, if I am not wrong. Uh, this is not a Voronoi partition. The, I think the cost function here is different. Okay, so mm -hmm. if, okay, so you, how do you decide the centers of these partitions? Like, oh, we just take the average of the, all the particles that fall in, uh, fall in the cell. Okay, I guess I didn't understand. Like, could you just go over how exactly do you partition the space? Like, mm -hmm. and how do you, yeah, if you could just give some more information about that. Right, so we simulate a set of particle trajectories and then we squeeze the trajectory of all time steps into one plot shown here. Then given the simulated uh, positions, we minimize the difference between the particle position and the centroid of the partition cells. And we, we solve this by using a k-means. This is basically a expectation maximization algorithm where at each step it computes the centroid of the partitions by taking the average. And then the second step is to uh, minimize the difference or to optimize the cost. By iteratively, by iteratively performing these two steps, uh, we can find a solution to this, to this optimization problem. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, yeah, hello, Monsieur. I have a follow up question. Uh -huh. So, uh, I understand that uh, for a subset of uh, uh, particles, you can find the uh, corresponding centroid. But, how do you determine the each of each uh, polygon? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand your question. So uh, let's say for, for this polygon 10, you, you got a, a set of particles, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. how, how do you determine the edges of these polygons, the boundary of oh. the polygon? So from the k-means, we can have the assignment on which particle belongs to which partition. And then we use the least square to fit a straight line to find the boundary of each cell. I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Oh, nothing from my side. You can continue. OK. So the best so here, like one simple like thought would be we can uh, project the particle trajectories onto the partitions in order to find a transition dynamics in the primary space. But then I will show later that we can do better than this. So to better explain the idea, I will use a toy problem. Here I'm defining the full state of the system as a 2D vector. Here I'm considering a deterministic dynamical system. And I'm defining the set of orthogonal bases that contains the full state here. And here the orthogonal bases are simply two vectors. Uh, one zero and zero one, the horizontal and the vertical direction of the 2D plane. I'm calling the first element as the resolved state and the second element as the unresolved state or the error state. The resolved state means that the state that we can model. This is a toy problem. So here is only, here we only have finite number of orthogonal bases. But if we consider a PDE, then there will be infinite number of orthogonal basis functions that contains the full state. We can only model finite number, of, uh, we can only model the system state using finite number of, of, of orthogonal basis functions. So the span of resolved state would contain, would be a set containing finite number of orthogonal basis functions. Given the span of the resolved state and the error state, we can find, we can define the resolved state by projection. This is just uh, here in this toy problem, the resolved state is just the first element in the 2D vector. And then similarly, we define the error state by projection to the other vector. So if we define the resolved dynamics, only by projecting 
the full dynamics, which is the matrix A, onto the span of the horizontal vector one zero, then we have the resolved dynamics shown here. And we can find the error dynamics by taking a difference between the full state and the resolved state. If we run a simulation, we can see that the model reduction error or the end result state will grow this time. And one intuition we get from this toy problem is we see that there's coupling between the resolved state and the error state. This is because we have B and C term in the uh, system dynamics. So if we can model the coupling terms and to add this model back to the resolved dynamics, then we, can, we might be able to make the resolved state better approximate the full state of the system. And this is exactly the basic idea of the morris lenzik formalism. But before introducing the equations, I want to first illustrate the idea on this toy problem. In this toy problem here, we can derive an analytical solution for the exact resolved state. So again, we write the resolved state as the projection. And then we take, we go one step before and to represent xk plus one by um, the system state at xk. And we decompose the full state into the resolved state plus the error state. But we do not know this, we cannot model this error state. So we describe the error state ek by the full state xk and the projection. And we again, iteratively, we go one step, time step before and describe xk using the full state at the previous time step. So by iteratively running this process, eventually we go to the initial time step. And here we have, um, we represent the resolved state at time step k plus one by sk hat and a, set, a sequence of historical resolved state and also the error state at the initial time step. If we compare this analytical solution with the inexact resolved dynamics by only projecting the transition dynamics onto the um, span of the resolved state, we see that we have a set of additional terms representing the non-Markovian memory effects because of the coupling between the resolved and the error state of the system. And this is the idea of the morris lenzik formalism. Before formally introducing the equation, I will first introduce a set of notation. We define the, we denote the partition cells from the finite, uh, focused finite partition by R. And we define a set of basis function containing the resolved state as phi, where each element is the indicator function. And we define the projection onto the resolved state of the system by this projection operator P. And this operator is just taking the average of the belief value in each of the cell. And similarly, we define the projection onto the error states as the projection Q. The projection Q is taking the difference between the full state and the resolved state. And then we can introduce the MZ formalism. And similarly to our toy problem, this MZ equation is an exact representation of the resolved state, which is the left-hand side of the equation. And it is saying that the left-hand side, this resolved state in the next time step can be represented by three terms. The first one that gets, and the second term is the memory term representing the uh, number of memory effects. And the last term is the noise term. This one is the coupling between the resolved state and the error state at the initial time step. And in the memory term and noise term, they are represented by use, defining this memory kernel function, G. Um, any questions so far? Okay. 
So in order to model the resolved state, we need to find approximation model for the right-hand side of the MC equation. For the first one, the best guess, this is uh, uh, it's easier to get an approximation model. So we consider the composition of the projection P and this transition dynamics. This is a Markovian transition model. And we can estimate each element in this transition matrix by counting the number of particles moving from one cell to another. So for example, if we want to know the transition probability from cell one to cell three, then there's only one particle that moves from one to three. And then we divide by the total number of particles in cell one. This is the cell mapping method. And this gives us the best gas transition dynamics. But then if we want to model the memory kernel, this is difficult. The memory kernel is, uh, the memory terms is infinitely long in time. And also the kernel function G is infinite dimensional. So there are a lot of existing works on how we can have approximation model, but then we have a, a time growing approximation here. So this motivates us to look into using neural networks to model the memory effects. So we are especially interested in using long short uh, LSTM or long short term memory because it has a recurrent cell. So it can capture the uh, number covian effects in the data sequence. And also because it has a forget gate, so it can avoid the vanishing gradient problem shown at, in other recurrent neural networks. So we consider using the LSTM. The input of the LSTM would be the resolved state at historical time steps. And we want the output of the LSTM to be the memory term or the sum of the memory term. To train the LSTM, we perform a set of offline simulation. And at each time step of the offline simulation, we compute the difference between the um, ground truth of the resolved state, which is the left-hand side of the MZ equation. And the best guess term, which is the first term in the MZ equation. And after we have this EK, the difference, we solve a regression problem that is minimizing the difference between the LSTM output and this difference term EK. So we run the algorithm on the on uh, simulation experiment. Here I'm considering the anywhere vehicle uh, running in a dryer flow field. And here on the right, I'm showing the comparison result of using the proposed neural network based estimation algorithm and using only the generalized cell mapping method. That is, we only consider the best guess as the resolved state, uh, as the resolved dynamics. And we see that by incorporating the LSTM to model the memory effects, we can achieve a mo lower model reduction error. And another insight we get from the simulation is uh, in this time horizon, the, the model reduction error stays relatively constant for our algorithm. So this motivates us to look into theoretical justification on the model reduction error to try to explain the, like why we can get a lower error bound. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Um, so we look into the model reduction here. The full state, uh, the full dynamics of the system is the belief dynamics. We have two steps, the prediction step, which is the prior dynamics, and then the update step. This is the Bayesian updating law. For the resolved dynamics, we have the symbolic transition incorporating the neural network as the prediction step. And then for the up update step, this is still the Bayesian law. Because after the update, B tilde may not be on the span formed by the set of basis functions. So we take additional step to project B tilde back onto the partitions. And then we discretize the belief value in each of a cell in order to find this 
as a symbolic representation. We define the model reduction error as the difference between the full state and the resolved state. To, analyze, to find the upper bound of this model reduction error, we decompose it into four parts. The first one is the error from Monte Carlo simulation. And then the second part is from the reduced order approximation. <clears throat> and then the third part is from the third step, the projection. And the first one is from the last step, the discretization. And to find the upper bound on the four terms, we need three assumptions. The first one is we are assuming the denominator of the Bayesian law is positive. This is to make sure the Bayesian updating law makes sense. And then the second assumption is I'm assuming the posterior and the prior are Lipschitz continuous. And the third assumption, this is the key assumption here. We are assuming that the LSTM can approximate arbitrary number of memory terms in the MZ equation. This is a fixed upper bound. And we, we know from previously, uh, we know from existing literature that the RNs are universal approximators. So given arbitrary depths and widths of the network, it can approximate any nonlinear function. So that's why we make this assumption. And given the three assumptions, we can prove the following theorem. At all time steps, we can find an upper bound of the moderate action error. And one interesting thing from this result is this model reduction error does not depend on the time step k. And this is a interesting uh, result. We, the reason is we, the reason why we can prove this time uniform error bound is because of this second term. This is the error from the inexact initial condition and the reduced order dynamics. If we look into this, um, this um, second term, then the error from the reduced order dynamics contains two parts. The first one is the ISTM approximation error. And then the second part is the noise term that we didn't model in the MZ equation. The first term we assume is constant. So we only need to look at the second term. We can prove that the memory kernel is contractive. So we, we can derive upper bound on the second term that is not growing with time. So that's the reason why we can prove a time uniform error bound for, the, um, belief, for our belief abstraction algorithm. So this, uh, this theoretical analysis is showing that by taking advantage of the MC formalism and the LSTM, we can achieve a lower model reduction error than the existing work, which is the cell mapping method. If we look further into this uh, upper bound, we see that it is changing the, according to the parameters of our algorithm. And it can be lower if we have a larger number of Monte Carlo simulation samples. And if we discretize the state space into finer resolution, then we can also have a lower bound on the model reduction error. And it's also changing with respect to the leaf value discretization resolution and also the system dimension. So this concludes my contribution in part one. Then I will talk about the belief space planning problem. So we are interested in incorporating the bounded call search to solve this belief space planning problem. So we follow the formulation of the bounded call search that is maximizing the probability of the total cost less than a pre-assigned upper bound C. The constraint of the system is the symbolic space transition dynamics. And we consider a finite number of control input of the system. So notice here that in the stage cost, we have an additional noise term, eta. We include this term because there will be uncertainty introduced by the model reduction error. So this will introduce an uncertainty in the stage cost by after taking um, the control input at each time step. 
because we have a decision tree structure from the belief abstraction algorithm. So we consider using the graph search methods. So for all the graph search methods that uses a evaluation function to determine which node in the decision tree should be searched next. For example, here I'm showing, a, oh, this video is not, oh, okay, it's playing. So for example, here, this is showing the A star. It's um, ordering the nodes in the decision tree by the evaluation function, which is the sum of the cost arrival plus the heuristics, which is the estimated cost to go. For digestra, it's only using the cost arrival. And then for greedy and A star and bonding cost search, they use different evaluation functions to order the nodes in the decision tree. But for our formulation, the challenge is we have a certain, so my contribution here is uh, given a uh, assumption on the distribution of uncertainty in the branch cost, we can find an evaluation function that solves the boundary cost search problem. And this is the evaluation function we derive. It's dependent on the estimated cost forever and cost goal, and also the pre-assigned upper bound C on the total cost. And given some assumptions, we can prove that this uh, evaluation function we propose can find the optimal solution to the bounded cost search problem. And then we run the simulation of the underwater vehicle navigation problem. We consider a dryer flow field and we assume there are several beacons available in the domain. Each beacon will provide a um, binary acoustic detection. Here, this, uh, the contours is showing the initial position of the vehicle and we want the vehicle to reach to the target set with high probability. To, to justify performance of our algorithm, we compare the proposed algorithm with the generalized star mapping method that is using the rectangular grids to discretize the state space. And to justify performance of the bounded cost search, we compare with the A star algorithm. And here, this is showing the simulation result. If we look at the comparison between the generalized, generalized cell mapping method and the partition, we see that by incorporating partitioning of the state space, we have a larger or higher computational cost in modeling the transition dynamics. This is because we take additional time to find the optimal partition. But then, we significantly reduce the time to solve the planning problem because by incorporating the partitions, we, de uh, we discretize the state space into smaller number of, uh, of cells and this reduces the computational cost. If you look at the comparison between the A star and the modified bound cost search, we also see that by introducing the suboptimal planning, we further reduce the time to solve the planning problem. And on the right, this is a simulation result where the tra simulated trajectory of the vehicle is shown by the particles. And at in the middle of the uh, simulation, because the variance of the partitions gets too large, we design the vehicle to the surface to get to go to the surface of the ocean to get the GPS signal to get it in order to get a good as better estimate of its current state. And then it continues uh, the mission until it reaches the target set. So here I want to provide a summary of the advantage of our algorithm. Um, we achieve a trade-off between the model reduction accuracy and the, the computational efficiency. And we try to achieve this goal by proposing the finite partition algorithm that is addressing the curse of dimensionality. And then we avoid the online computational cost by offline learning the MC equation and also introducing the modified bounded cost search algorithm for belief space planning. And certainly we improve on the model reduction accuracy by introducing by modeling the MZ equation 
and we show by historic analysis that it can guarantee a bonding model reduction error and the upper bound does not change with time. So we, um, so I, as you can see, all of my research is motivated by the marine autonomy applications. And we have a software toolbox that is designed for a real-time decision-making of underwater glider experiments in the ocean. We have run this genius, this toolbox for many good deployments in the ocean. And this is one of the most recent one where we use genius to pilot without human intervention for one week in the Great Reef area. And it, it successfully um, uh, fulfills the mission. This, is, this video is showing the vehicle trajectory. But many times, so we implemented a different optimal control algorithm in Genius, and it can give a reasonable decision for the underwater glider. But many times the human is not satisfied and the human operator may say, let's just fly the glider perpendicular to the flow direction. This is different than the output of our optimal control algorithm. So we are interested in the following question. What is the human hidden intention when the human gives an instruction like this? But this is a difficult problem because in the marine autonomy missions, the intention can be really high, high dimensional and also it can change over time. So instead we look at a uh, human robot interaction in the indoor structure in the lab. And we consider using GTMAP or Georgia Tech Miniature Autonomous Blink for the human robot interaction experiment. The good thing about this platform is it poses no safety threat to the human. So we consider using the pointing motion for the human to control the blimp. And we, we asked the human to choose two target positions in the 3D space. This are, these two points are the human, human hidden intention. The human is asked to drive the blimp towards the target position by moving the wand. And we want to identify the human hidden intention from the, uh, the trajectory of the wand and also the blimp. So this is a much easier problem to solve because the human hidden intention is time invariant and also is low dimensional. So we look into the, this ex experiments and we find the similarity between the human interaction with the blimp, with the human interaction with the computer when controlling the pointer or the cursor position with the computer mouse. And we also see a difference between the human blimp interaction and the human com computer interaction. The blimp is a physical system. As you can see from its trajectory, it cannot respond instantaneously to the controller or to the command of the human. So we wonder whether the closed loop system formed by the human and the And we look into the uh, stability analysis and we can prove that it is exponentially stable. stable. So we showed that the blimp can act as a pointer or a cursor similar to a cursor on a, on a computer screen. And this is all of my talk. Here are some of the publications and thank you. Well, thanks so much, Mangshu, that was great. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? You can either type into the chat or unmute yourself. Um, I can start with one. I was wondering whether, so your partitions right now are fixed, right? And they don't change over time, is that correct? Right. Uh, so I was wondering, so in the in quantized control, there's this kind of notion of zooming in and zooming out in terms of partitions that there seemed to be a nice analogy here where you know you have your state space, you can only represent it with a finite number of bits. And so you first kind of have a very coarse quantization where you're trying to get a sense of is the state in this space versus that space. And then you kind of zoom in and make the partitions finer and finer. Is there a way to think about that kind of analogy with uh, time varying partitions in your in your framework? Yeah, I think that's definitely like a in, 
like a very nice direction to go. Um, I so I thought about making the partition time varying before, but I, like I didn't find a good approach to solve this problem because in that case the transition dynamics will also be time varying, and then how to how to identify the Markovian transition and also how to identify the memory effects, the like the additional terms in the MZ equation, um, that would be a like a difficulty. So that's why we keep the partition time invariant to make sure the estimation is easier. So in that in your upper bound right now, is that term that comes from the partition, is that going to be sort of constant, meaning there's going to be a lower bound on your estimation error always? So yeah, the, the error come like the error that comes from the partition is the third third error from the projection tab. Okay. And if, yeah. So if the if we have the Lipschitz continuous assumption, then we can have an upper bound on this term. But will that go to zero or will that stay? No, that, that will not go to zero. Okay. It yeah. has a upper bound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any questions from um, also I, I was wondering about the uh, going to the surface right in that case I mm -hmm. guess you're essentially resetting your error to zero is that correct when because you're yeah. getting okay. yeah we, we assume that once we get the GPS signal we have a perfect um, estimation of the vehicle position so is that planned for formally in your planning form right now? Meaning the, I presume there's a cost associated with going to the surface. And so is there a way to sort of plan ahead of time to say we should go to the surface here and here and here? Right, yeah, we actually have a term like in the cost function representing the cost of going to the surface. Okay. It's just the time takes to surface and then dive. Yeah. Got it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to think of this in an event triggered way where if you, you go where when your belief goes bigger than a certain value, then yeah. you should go to the surface? Yeah, this is actually, <laughs> yeah, this is exactly the thing I'm thinking right now. Like, I think this is my like current step of research is if we consider like a higher level abstracted actions or tasks like going to the surface and get GPS localization signal, then this is an event. And we have the lower level control input of the system, which is the heading angle and like maybe some motor input, then this would be a like event trigger problem. And we can have a mixed integer optimization formulation for this kind of for this kind of mess uh, problems. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. Are there any other questions from the audience at this point? All right, well, fantastic talk. Thank you so much. It was really interesting okay. stuff. So thank you to everybody for attending. And if you have any questions for Ming Zhe, I think you can feel free to email her as well. And we're looking forward to having her here at Purdue in the fall. You'll have plenty of opportunity to collaborate with her then as well. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.